Hello, I am D100. This is your instructor, Ross Johnson, and we are here in week three of our course materials talking about chapter three of your textbook, Visualizing Technology. This chapter talks about file management. Let's dive in. Today we are going to learn about folders and the purpose of folders, their function, and certain ways they can be used in both Windows and Mac operating systems. We're going to talk about file extensions and how those affect the files that they are appended to. We're going to talk about backing up and how important it is to back up your files in order to avoid catastrophic loss. We're going to talk about file compression, what compressing a file does, and its purpose, and what you might use it for today. We'll talk about advanced search options in both Windows and Mac platforms. And finally, we'll talk about default program associations. First, let's talk about folders. Folders on your computer are the very rudimentary basis of file structure. They are containers used to organize files on your computer. Here we have an icon of the Mac OS folder. And of course the Windows folder looks very similar to this. On a side note, this is what is called a skewomorphic icon. That means an icon that is a representation in a digital form of a real world object. So even though this is not an actual folder, literally, as in a paper folder that you might have papers in from class. On your computer, it resembles a folder, and so that's called a skeuomorphic representation. Moving beyond folders, we have what's called libraries. Libraries are like folders, but they're dynamic. When it comes to a folder, you decide what goes in that folder. You move things in or out of that folder yourself manually. When it comes to a library, the computer will control the contents of that folder by gathering those files from different locations wherever they might be on your PC. So for example, if you've got a movie file that might be a .mp4 file, that might be a .mov file, it might be a flash movie, it might be a GIF, very many different types of movie files and very many different locations that they might reside on your computer. When it comes to a library, that library will dynamically gather all those different types of movie files into one folder called the movie library. This, for instance, is what the movie library looks like on a Mac. And the Mac also has libraries for music and for pictures. Documents is another example of a library. We'll show you where to access these libraries in the file management system on your PC, whether that's Windows or Mac. But um, the bottom line is that libraries are dynamically populated. Here we have a picture of the Finder window. So again, the Finder is the very basic program on a Mac computer that is used to navigate both files, documents, and your applications. Right here we've got libraries highlighted on the left side in the sidebar. These libraries will gather documents, pictures, and music from wherever they might be on your computer, whether you've just downloaded them and they're in the downloads folder, whether they're, they're on your desktop, or whether they're in another folder that you've created manually. These libraries will gather those files and show them in that location. So it's another way to, at a glance, look at all the music on your computer, for example, or all the pictures. 
Going back to folders, folders provide a high degree of flexibility. You should use folders in a way that makes sense to you. So create an organizational scheme that fits your needs. One thing that I recommend to students, and actually one thing that I do myself as a master's student, is to create separate folders for each class. And then within, um, excuse me, without, on the outside of that folders, we create a semester. So, for example, here we are in the fall of 2019. Within that fall of 2019 folder, I've got separate folders for all of the classes that I might be taking. They're what's called nested inside that fall 2019 folder. But then again, that's just one way of organizing, and you should decide what works for you when it comes to organizing your documents within folders. Folders can be created using the Save As dialog box. So when you go to save a document, whether that's a Word document, as we see in our example here, or a PowerPoint document, any other sort of document you might be working on, when you go to save it, you can choose a folder that already exists, or you can create a new folder according to your needs. The folders that you create on your computer using your computer can reside in many different places. They can reside locally on the computer itself. You could make a folder on a flash drive that you've plugged into your computer. And you can also create a folder in cloud storage, places like Google Drive, iCloud, or Dropbox. These folders look like they reside on your computer, and perhaps they do if they are being synced down to your computer. But the important thing is that they, while they look like they're on your computer, they are also residing in the cloud. What that means is that files that you create live elsewhere. While you might make a Word document or you might make a PowerPoint file on your computer, when you save it to a folder that is in the cloud, a folder that's in Google Drive or iCloud or Dropbox or OneDrive, that file actually lives in the cloud and in that folder organizational structure there. We'll dive a little bit more into that later. But ultimately a good folder scheme, the mark of a good folder scheme, allows you, the user, to find and quickly retrieve a file. So it's up to you to, again, decide what works for you and how you can organize your files within folders to make things easy to get to. On a Windows computer, you can get to your files and folders through this program called File Explorer. If you go to the Windows taskbar and look in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see this icon. Here it is blown up. This File Explorer icon will allow you to navigate through your files, through your folders, and through your libraries on your computer. This is a quick overview of the different elements of a File Explorer window on a Windows computer. At the very top, we've got what's called the ribbon. The ribbon has a number of different tabs. Here we've got the Computer tab open with all these different settings that you can change. If you wanted to switch to the View tab, you might have different settings that deal with what the icons in this window look like. Moving on, we've got the address bar. This should look similar to a web browser like Google Chrome or Firefox. Essentially, you enter into this address bar where you want to go. You can type it manually or you can search using the search box. If you know exactly where you want to go, type it manually into the address bar. If you don't know exactly where your file is, if for some example you've downloaded a file and you don't know exactly where it resides on your computer, you can search for it. On the left hand side is the navigation pane. This is also called the sidebar. 
So we can see here in this navigation pane, at the very top, we've got quick access locations. These locations are pinned to the sidebar. Again, you can choose what's pinned and what's not pinned, meaning that you can choose what stays here all the time. Desktop, Documents, and Pictures, uh, excuse me, Documents and Pictures particularly, are libraries. So again, locations where certain types of files gather together dynamically as a result of your computer. Finally, the file list area has the meat of Windows File Explorer. This is where you can see all the different file structures as well as all the different devices that might reside on your computer. This OS device is the hard drive. You can see here if you put a CD or DVD into your computer, it would show up here. If you have a USB drive plugged into your computer, it might look something like this. And if you had another external hard drive plugged into your computer, it might look something like this. So again, these are different devices that are part of your computer, either internally, like the hard drive, or plugged in via a USB cord, like this external hard drive, or like this flash drive. Now, on a Mac computer, instead of Windows File Explorer, you use what's called Finder. Again, Finder is located in a very similar position on a Mac as File Explorer is on a PC. Finder is located in the bottom left-hand corner of the dock by default. Here it is right here, and here's the icon blown up. Finder is a little bit different from, from Windows File Explorer because it can not only be used to navigate the file system on your computer, meaning all the documents and folders that you have, but it can also be used to navigate the applications on your Mac. So it provides a little bit extra functionality that you don't get on a PC. Let's go through the elements of a Finder window. At the very top, you've got the toolbar, sort of like the ribbon in Windows File Explorer. These are your view options, which allow you to change how these contents look in the Finder. The search box is in much the same position at the top of the window and on the right hand side. Here's the sidebar, again with what are called libraries, places like documents, movies, music, and pictures that dynamically assemble all of those types of files on your computer into one library, into one place. And finally, the meat of the Finder window is the contents area, where you can navigate through all of your folders, files, and libraries. Let's talk a little bit about file extensions. When you name a file, it has two parts. The first is the file name. When you go to save a file, for example, let's say you did some homework for chapter three uh, in a certain class. You named it chapter underscore three underscore homework. That's what you would enter in the save as dialog box. After you do that, naming the file, the program itself will append or add a file extension to the end of that file name. If you were using Microsoft Word in this example, it would add a file extension called DOCX or DOCX. So we can see that the file name comes in two parts. The name itself, which in this case chapter 3 homework, and the file extension, in this case .docx. On Windows, a file name can be up to 260 characters long, and on a Mac computer, just a little shorter than that, at 255 characters. When it comes to both systems, this file name character limit includes both the extension and the path to the file. So going back to this example of Chapter 3 homework, 
we've got the file name here, Chapter 3 Homework. We've got the file extension, docx. But when it comes to the entire file name, we also need to include the path to the file. So this document, in this example, is in a folder called IMD100. And that folder lives in another folder called Documents. And if we dive even further up the scope, we can see that that Documents folder lives on the C drive, which is a very common, in fact, the common name for the hard drive of a computer. So when it comes to the file name length, you need to take into account the, the entire length of this whole path, c colon backslash documents backslash imd underscore 100, so on and so forth. Of course, this will very rarely come into to play because most file names are short, and unless you have a, an extremely extensive file structure system, you're going to be hard-pressed to come up against that 260 or 255 character limit. Now when it comes to naming files, you can put spaces in your file names, you can put some special characters, but as we'll see in the next slide, there are some characters that are not allowed in file names. We see here, again, before we go on, underscores in the file name. This is a holdover from the olden days of computing, back when you could not have spaces in a file name. So in order to have uh, separation between words, for example, chapter, three, and homework, you would have to put in an underscore to give the file name a space. You couldn't just hit the space bar and put a space in you had to have an underscore because you had to have a character within that file name. Nowadays, this is unnecessary, so you'll still see under underscores from time to time, but for the most part, they are unnecessary in both Windows and Mac environments. Now, as far as special characters that are not allowed in file names, Windows has quite a few special characters that you cannot put in a file name. A less than sign, a greater than sign, colon, quote marks, forward or backslashes, a vertical bar, question mark or asterisk. None of these characters are allowed in a Windows file name. When it comes to a Mac file name, almost all of these characters are allowed, in fact but a colon is still not allowed in a Mac file name. One note when it comes to naming files. It's a good idea, even though most of these characters are allowed in a file name if you're on a Windows computer, it's still a good idea to avoid them. And why is that? Let's say your file, you'll be transferring it from a, from a Windows computer, to a Mac. You want to reduce the chances for a problem. So avoid, if you can, avoid using these characters at all. Because it'll make your life a whole lot easier when it comes to moving data, moving files from Windows to Mac. Just to show you an example of file names and file extensions, here we are looking at a finder window. This is actually the finder on my Mac. We can see here, this is uh, an entire file name. And here is the file extension, .pdf. Let's take a look at some of the different types of file extensions. We've seen .docx, which is a Word file. Here it is right here in this table. And we've also seen .pdf. Let's take a look at some of the other file formats. A file that is created in WordPad or Word, which are generic versions of word processors found on most PCs, it might have a file extension called .rtf. 
The program that that's created with on a Mac is called TextEdit. When it comes to a Pages document, if you recall from last week's lecture, Pages is the Mac version of Microsoft Office's Word. Pages is the Mac word processor. A Pages document comes with a .pages file extension. So there is no default program that opens Pages files on Windows. On Macs, of course, Pages files are opened by the Pages program. Excel files are typically uh, have an extension .xlsx. That's an Excel file. On Windows, those files open in Excel, and on Mac, they also open in Excel. So again, this file extension is associated with the Excel software. When it comes to PowerPoint files, the extension for a PowerPoint file is .pptx. That file is opened by default with PowerPoint on Windows and PowerPoint on Macs. We've got a couple different types of image files that, that can be created on computers. The first is a .bmp for bitmap. That particular type of file is associated with paint, which is a very simple drawing and uh, image manipulation piece of software on a Windows PC. On a Mac, that image file is opened with what's called Preview. That's the name of the program, Preview. Another type of image file is a JPEG, .jpeg, or commonly you'll see .jpg. That stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. It's simply a holdover from how the file format was created. On a Windows computer, JPEGs open in photos, and on a Mac, JPEGs traditionally, by default, open in preview. So again, all of these file extensions, really they're not necessary to memorize uh, verbatim, but they will help you when it comes to identifying a file and knowing what program it should open with. Let's take a look at a few more. PDF files are named with a .pdf. Again, PDFs are typically used for images of uh, uneditable images of documents and papers. PDF stands for Portable Document Format. On a Windows PC, PDFs typically open by default with Adobe Acrobat and Adobe Reader. Adobe Reader is a free version of a PDF reader for Windows, and Adobe Acrobat is a paid version that comes along with the Adobe Creative Suite or Adobe Creative Cloud. On a Mac, PDFs open in preview. Moving along to different types of audio files, a .mp3 file, which I'm sure many of you for, are familiar with, is an audio file. It's a song or a music file or some other type of audio recording. MP3, the name, comes from this acronym, Moving Picture Experts Group Audio Layer 3. It's simply uh, an explanation of how the MP3 format used to come about. And it's just a bit of history there in the file extension. On a Windows PC, MP3s typically, by default, open in Windows Media Player. On a Mac, they open in iTunes. An AAC file is another type of audio file that stands for Advanced Audio Coding. Again, those open in very similar places as MP3 files on uh, Windows and Mac. And it oh, went one slide ahead too quickly. An AAC file is a proprietary version of an audio file that Apple has created. So even on a Windows PC, an AAC file will open by default in iTunes, which is an Apple product. And again, we can see some video files here. A .mov file is a QuickTime video file. 
that opens in the QuickTime program on both Windows and Mac. And when it comes to .wmv files, that stands for Windows Media Video, that is a proprietary Windows type of file. So just like .aac files are a proprietary Mac audio file, .wmv files are a proprietary Windows video file. So there is no native player, although you can download a player to play back WMV videos on a Mac. On Windows, of course, they open with Windows Media Player. When it comes to files that have been created, file extensions are important and they determine where a file was created and where a file can be opened in what program. Another attribute of files are file properties. They're simply a, a series of identifying elements that are attached to a file. Most of the properties of files are automatically created when you or somebody else makes a file. For example, when you make a, a new Word document or you make a new audio file, the properties will be attached to it automatically by the computer, by the operating system. Some properties include file type and size and the date the file was created as well as the date modified, meaning when the file was changed, if it was changed. Again, these properties are automatically created by the computer. Some of the other properties of files are created by you, the user. Such things as the title, the author. These properties can be added after the fact, after the file is created. If we look over here in this example, we can see just a small screenshot of the Mac OS Finder window. Again, if you'll recognize, these are the view options here at the top. And what we've done is select what we want to see as far as file properties, how we want to, uh, what columns we want to show in the Finder window. So if we want to see, typically you you always want to see the name of the file. You might also want to see the kind of file it is, the application it's associated with, these properties which deal with the date it was created, modified, and added to your computer, as well as things like size, how big the file is. So in Finder, you have the option to show all of these file properties and you have the option to sort by these file properties. On Windows, to, sh to see the properties of a file, open the File Explorer, right-click on the file to bring up a context menu, which looks like this, and then click on the Properties button. That will bring up a window, which looks like this. Here's an example of the properties of a file. We can see here the type of file is a .pdf file, that's the extension. The default program that this PDF file opens with is Adobe Acrobat on that computer. Here's the path to the file. The file lives, in this case, on the C drive, which is the hard drive of the computer, in the user's folder. Inside that folder is a folder called R. Johnson. This is my computer, by the way. That lives in a folder called Google Drive, and finally in a folder called Documents. So we can see here, no underscore, we've got a space in that folder name, and that's not a problem. Uh, it used to be, and that's why folks used underscores, but nowadays, like I said, sorry about that, like I said, file names and folder names can contain spaces. We can see a few more of the properties, things like the size and when the file was created, modified, and accessed. On Mac OS, how to see properties, again, open the File Explorer, in this case Finder, 
right click on a file to bring up this context menu and instead of properties like we clicked on the Windows computer click get info and that will bring up this window which is the properties window on a Mac and it looks a little different but it has almost the exact same pieces of information the name of the file how big it is when it was modified when it was created the path to the file so in this case where the file lives on the computer and things like that let's talk a little bit about backing up files I'm not sure if any of you have been burned by working long and hard on a project not saving not backing up and losing the work that you've done I've done it a couple times and it is a heartbreaker every time so backing up is so so important and it's good computer hygiene I like to say a good habit that it's important to practice every day when it comes to backing up one of the easiest things you can do is set up your computer to automatically back things up that way you don't even have to worry about it less things for you to think about and allow the computer to take care of the hard work we'll talk about how to do that but what is a backup a backup is a copy of files from your computer stored in another location that's important if your computer dies for some reason if it's damaged if it's lost if it's stolen if somebody deletes your files a backup will allow you to retrieve all those lost files you've got options when it comes to backups you can back up your files to someplace like an internal hard drive some computers typically not laptops but some desktop computers and when it comes to higher processing power machines like servers will have second uh, third and even fourth hard drives sometimes even more than that uh, these hard drives are inside the chassis inside the computer itself but because they are a separate location another location from the C drive from the uh, primary hard drive they are a backup of your files a second place for them to live that keeps them safe you can also back up your files to an external hard drive you might recognize brands like Seagate or Western Digital these are external hard drives that don't live inside the computer but that you can plug in do your backup unplug and take somewhere else this is not so common nowadays but you can also back up to an optical drive meaning a CD or a DVD that you can burn your data to uh, this is still used in some some functions but uh, not so common today especially now as computers fewer and fewer computers have optical drives at all uh, my laptop for instance doesn't even have a DVD drive so if I wanted to back up to an optical drive I would have to plug in an external optical drive uh, so it's good to know about but not exactly what's used mostly today a flash drive however is something that's still in uh, heavy use today that's a drive that plugs in via a USB port to your computer and again you can plug it in do your backup unplug and take it to another location keep it safe another place to back up is to a local area network for example, uh, the local area network at your school or your business. Here at BCTC, uh, we have had uh, what's called the H drive, and that is a location on the computer that looks like it resides locally on the computer, but actually saves those files off the computer on what's uh, called a server that's a, a location somewhere else outside of that local computer somewhere on campus or maybe on one of the other campuses let's say you're at Cooper the server might be at uh, at Leestown or we're here at Newtown campus the server might be uh, somewhere else somewhere off-site to keep it safe 
Finally, another place to back up would be to the internet, to what's called the cloud. That's very common today, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The point of these online backup services, or any other backup for that matter, is to provide redundancy. If something happens to the files, there's another copy somewhere safe. An on-premise backup is something that's there in the same building. So let's say you're backing up to the Newtown server, and you're also here taking classes in Newtown. Well, if the Newtown classroom building burned down, God forbid that it does, but if it did, both the original files and the backups would be destroyed. So the on-premise backup has a bit of a drawback. There's a better benefit in an off-site backup, a backup to another location, another building, maybe even another campus or another city. The, uh, the distance really doesn't matter, but what's important is that it's in another location to provide it more safety for your backup files. When it comes to Windows, the backup utility in Windows that comes standard with every PC is called File History. It's off by default, so when you get your new Windows computer, you'll have to turn File History on. You can get to it through the control panel and through the System and Security uh, section of the control panel. You will need an external drive like an external hard drive or like a USB drive or a network location like the H drive to store the backup. In this example, file history is backing up files from all the libraries, the desktop, contacts, and favorites, and it's backing them up to a USB drive right here. On Mac OS, the backup is called Time Machine. Time Machine is accessible through the Launchpad, which is found on the dock, or in System Preferences. When you open Time Machine, the configuration page will, will pop open. It looks like this. Remember how I said that uh, one benefit of backups is to let the computer do the hard work, especially the work of remembering to backup. That's some of the the most difficult uh, issue of backing up is just simply remembering that you've made changes and that you need to save them. Something like Time Machine on a Mac will back up those files automatically. We can see here that option is checked. Uh, if you dive a little deeper into here, this will show you exactly how Time Machine backs up your files. When you come to the cloud, Cloud Backup will back up your files look from a location locally on your computer to some place on the internet. And of course, when we mean the internet, we really mean somewhere else off-site. The servers that Dropbox or Google Drive or iCloud or OneDrive, all these different cloud backup solutions, the locations that they use are off-site. A lot of these services will offer a minimal free storage, meaning just about one to five gigabytes. It's not a whole lot, but it might be enough to get by without having to pay. When it comes to uh, needing unlimited storage, if you need to store, say, more than five gigs, you can typically buy more storage via subscription. And again, some of the examples of cloud backup services are Microsoft OneDrive, iCloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, Mosey, and Carbonite. And we're just going to talk a little bit more about OneDrive and iCloud. On OneDrive, you can manually save files directly. So when you go to Word and you choose a location to save, you can choose to save to OneDrive, meaning it's not saving exactly on your computer locally, it's saving somewhere online to the cloud. It might look like it's on your computer, but if you are saving to OneDrive, you are saving to the cloud. Another benefit is that you can use OneDrive to automatically sync certain folders. Let's say you want to save your documents, or your desktop, or photos, or movies. You can save those libraries or folders automatically. It'll do it without you having to worry about it. 
So again, taking the effort off of you and your thought process and putting it at the backup utility. When it comes to getting to files that are saved in Microsoft OneDrive, you can get to them from a web interface via the browser, something like Google Chrome or Firefox, or you can get to those files that are backed up using File Explorer in the desktop client. And that's where files look like they're on your computer, but they are in a OneDrive library that is actually being synced to the cloud. And here we've got an example of what the OneDrive interface looks like in the browser. In iCloud, again, iCloud works automatically. There is no manual way to back up certain files unless you drag them to a location that iCloud is syncing. So for example, if you have a file that you've created and you want to make sure that it's saved to the cloud, you need to put it in one of these locations that are being automatically synced to iCloud. The way that you access the files is through the native file management. So that would be on your Mac Finder. You get to files just like normal, but because you have iCloud set up, those files are being backed up. So when you make a change or you move a file, or you uh, even if you delete a file, those changes will be reflected in the cloud in your backup. Here's a quick example of the Apple iCloud configuration page, which is visible through system preferences on the Mac. Let's talk quickly about how to compress files. What is compression? Compression is the process of making files smaller. So we talk in terms of kilobytes, and when uh, files get larger, we get into megabytes. If files get even larger, say it's a movie file or a, a very large uh, image file, very large, it would be in gigabytes. And there are, I don't think there are any files, singular files, that would be the size of terabytes, but that would be the next size of file. So why do we want to compress files? Well, save space on your computer. Of course, a hard drive has a limited size. So compressing a file makes it smaller, gives you more space. Compression also makes a file easier to transfer, especially when it comes to something like email. Typically, uh, most email clients will limit you from sending a file that's larger than 25 megabytes. So that can be a problem when you're trying to send large files. One way to eliminate that problem is to compress the files first and then try sending them via email once they've gotten smaller than 25 gigs. There are two different ways, two different formats, here we call them algorithms, for compressing files. Lossy compression and lossless compression. Let's talk a little bit about those two. When it comes to lossy compression, this type of compression is used when a file contains more info than a human can detect. Files like images, like audio or video files. These files have a lot of data in them. Much more than we can perceive with our human eyes or our ears. So lossy compression removes some of that data but keeps the file intact as far as the way we see it or hear it. It reduces what's called the resolution of the file. So if you've ever seen a file, a picture for example, that looks incredibly pixelated, the resolution of that file has been reduced, meaning uh, uh, the quality of the file has gotten less. The sweet spot for compression is to reduce the size of the file by reducing the resolution, but not reducing it so much that you can notice what's been done. So not reducing, not compressing so much that the file looks bad or sounds bad. The benefit of lossy compression is that really it can reduce the file size quite a bit. But the downside is that a lot of data can be lost. And when you 
when it comes to decompressing the file, you don't get that file that data back. Lossless compression is used for files that contain text or numbers, so not pictures, not audio, or not video, but actual data, strings like text and numbers, when you need to make sure that those numbers are accurately and totally high fidelity, high fidelity represented again. Things like bookkeeping, for example. If you're an accountant, you'd want to use lossless compression. You don't want to lose any one of those numbers because those might represent dollars for you or your customer, your client. How does lossless, com lossless compression work? Well, it takes advantage of redundant information. If on your, let's continue with the bookkeeping analogy. If on the first line of your spreadsheet, you've got uh, $100, and again on the fourth line, you've got $100, lossless compression will recognize that pattern that redundancy and it will say instead of recording 100 twice it can tell you that 100 is on the first line and the fourth line of course it doesn't tell you this particularly it's a it's a pattern it's an algorithm that the computer uses to compress nothing that you have to worry about as the user so again the benefit of lossless compression is that you can decompress without losing any of the data but the downside is that lossless files are still quite large and uh, they are larger than if you used lossy compression. Let's go back one file, uh, one slide here to talk about file compression in Windows. The zip format is what a compressed file looks like in Windows. So in this case the file extension is .zip. Some programs on Windows that uh, do file compression, 7-zip, WinRAR, WinZip, or StuffIt. And uh, most of these programs, if not all of them, I'm not exactly sure, I haven't checked into all of them recently, but most of them uh, should be free. So again, uh, an easy way to compress your files if need be. On a Mac, it's very easy to compress files. You can actually do that natively. It's built in to the operating system. All you have to do is open up the Finder window. Here we've got an example of a finder window. I've selected uh, these four files, lecture one, lecture two, through these four lectures. I've selected them and I've right clicked on them to bring up this context menu. And once that pops up you click compress. Once you compress the files it'll create something called an archive. And again this file extension is the same on Mac as it is on PC. It's a .zip file. So this compressed file will be smaller than the size of these independently and it'll give you so much flexibility when it comes to storing or transferring, uh, sharing those files. Uh, one last note about file compression. It's becoming not as necessary these days simply because the cost of data storage is getting so much cheaper so it used to be very expensive to have even a hundred gigabyte hard drive. But nowadays we have ten times that for probably the same price as it was not too long ago. You can buy one terabyte hard drives, which is one thousand gigabytes, for a pretty reasonable price. So the need to compress things is becoming less and less. It still comes into play when it comes to sending files over email, but for the most part compression is uh, uh, largely a thing of the past unless you get into very very large files. And those instances will, will come to you as uh, you advance in your careers. Let's talk quickly about searching on a computer. Files can be searched for on a Windows computer in many locations in Help and Support window, in the Control Panel, in the File Explorer, and down here in the Taskbar if you click on the Start menu. And you can also search using Cortana, which is the Windows built-in personal assistant. In this example, if we're entering in the search menu, the, uh, excuse me, the search box, 
uh, we start typing in STO, Windows will go ahead and start searching for things that start with STO or that contain those letters, those characters, STO. So we see here the first match that pops up is store. But there's a couple of other options that also have STO. So searching is dynamic in this case. As you continue to complete this search term, the search results will get more and more specific. On a Mac, a couple places to search. You can search in the Finder. Here at uh, the top bar of the Finder window, here's the search box. You can also search in Spotlight, which will search all kinds of objects, not only the files and folders which are in Finder, but your contacts and other objects on the computer. If you see a magnifying glass on a Mac, that's how to get to Spotlight. It's in a lot of places, including here in the Finder. You can also get to Spotlight by using a hotkey, hitting the Command button, which is this icon on a Mac computer keyboard, plus the spacebar. That will bring up a window like this, called Spotlight. And finally, you can use Siri, which is like Cortana, but for a Mac. It's a built-in personal assistant that will do the searching for you. Let's talk quickly about some search tips. So, searching can be simple. You can simply type a word, or you can type a, a file extension. For example, if you want to look for PowerPoint files on your computer, you can type .ppt into your search window to look for PowerPoint files. But you can also use things like Boolean logic, which is a, a form of logic that is popular not only in computers, but in mathematics and in philosophy. You'll find it all over the place. It's created in the 19th century by George Boole, and what it means is uh, using special search operators, words like and, or, and not, which in this case mean specific things. So, for example, if you're searching and you type into your search box John and Kennedy using the Boolean operator and, you'll get all the search results at the middle of this Venn diagram that contain both terms, John and Kennedy. In this case, just these here in the middle. If you use the Boolean operator or, you'll get search results that include either term that you use so, for example, if you search for John or Kennedy, you'll get, in this Venn diagram, all of the terms that contain both John, Kennedy alone, and John and Kennedy here in the middle. So, for example, you might get search results that say John Glenn uh, or um, Kennedy Space Center things that aren't specifically John Kennedy. And you can also use the Boolean operator not. So if you wanted to find uh, search results for John, but you did not want to see results for Kennedy, use the Boolean operator not to see everything that has John in it, but not the things that have Kennedy, or the things that say John and Kennedy. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if you play around with these Boolean search operators on your computer or uh, in Google, they can be used there as well. Uh, just play with it a little bit and you'll, you'll gain an understanding of how to use these operators and uh, they can make your searches much more powerful. Finally, let's talk about uh, default programs. On a computer, the default program is the program that opens automatically when you click a certain type of file. Uh, these default programs are determined by the extension of the file. So in this case, uh, you've got photos. Uh, those might be uh, .jpegs that we talked about, .jpg or .jpeg files. On this computer, in this example, .jpegs and .jpeg files are opened by default with the program photos. 
So some file types can be opened by multiple different applications. We talked about JPEGs. Uh, they could be opened in a Windows computer with photos, but they could also be opened with the program Paint. Or they could also be opened with the program Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop. So when it comes to setting the defaults, you can change what a JPEG opens with, what program a JPEG opens with. You can change what program an MP3 file opens with automatically. If you change that file extension, so again, the file name is uh, up to you. And when you're looking in Finder on a Mac or when you're looking in File Explorer on a PC, you see the file name, which has the, the, the name of the file itself plus the dot and the extension. If you change that extension, you can render the file unopenable or inoperable. So it's important to uh, pay attention to file extensions and uh, not change them unless you need to. I've come across a couple examples where online I've downloaded a file that's supposed to be a PDF, for example. Uh, when I download it, it's got a different type of file extension, and I click on it, the file won't open. Well, by changing the extension, you will change how the computer tries to open that file, what the default program is that will be used to open that file. So in that rare instance, changing the file extension is a good thing. It'll help that file, it'll help you open that file. But for the most part, changing the file extension is not necessary. And like I said, it will make files impossible to open. On a Windows PC, setting the default programs is here in the control panel. If you go to control panel, programs and default programs, you can set all the defaults. So for example, if you clicked on uh, the default programs for uh, a web URL, a web address, you can change the default from Google Chrome to Internet Explorer to Microsoft Edge to Mozilla Firefox, just to name a few of the browsers. That could be the default. Uh, you choose what program you want to open that particular kind of file. All right, I think we've gone through today and covered quite a lot of content. Uh, by the end of today, I hope that you all will have had the chance to complete the IT sim for this chapter. The IT sim is about file management. By this Sunday, which is September 15th, we're going to add something new. Uh, let me know if you have any difficulty but what I would like for you all to do is to do a quiz. Uh, this is a chapter 3 quiz called a VizCheck quiz. There's two parts to it, part 1 and 2. Um, just like the IT sims, you have multiple chances to take this quiz. So you do not have to get 100% the first time around. But it does behoove you to take the quiz as many times as you can, take the quiz all three times, to get that 100. And you've got until Sunday at midnight, uh, actually 11.59 p.m. to do that, Chapter 3 Viz Check Quiz, both Parts 1 and 2. And then by the time I see you next Wednesday, we will be back in our classroom. We will be back meeting in person on Wednesday, the 18th of September. So for that day, I want you to come to class prepared, having read the Chapter 4 of our e-text and also do that chapter 4 IT sim. Uh, it's about hardware. That will give you a chance to get some hands-on experience with the content for that week. And then again, the pattern will be uh, do some work for a Wednesday deadline on the day of class, and then do the quiz to wrap up that content by Sunday. So after next Wednesday, after the 18th, We'll, we'll, we will open up the Chapter 4 VizCheck quiz. I'll talk about this in class, just so we're all on the same page. But again, the pattern will be to uh, do some preparation, do some reading, and do the IT sims in preparation for our meeting on Wednesday. And then just wrap up your week of work on Sunday 
by doing the VizCheck quizzes. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, send me an email or I will see you all in class on uh, the 18th. Thanks again and uh, have a great week.